Is the world knowable? Pepe Phoenix. Is the world knowable? This question was clearly raised, then analyzed and certified in detail by the founder of German classical philosophy, Immanuel Kant, 1724 to 1804. Kant said, "In this world, there are two things worth looking up to for our whole life. One is the bright starry sky above us." The other is noble moral law in people's minds. The starry heavens fill us with wonder and awe for its profound vastness. Morality is holy for its solemnity, which is worth our whole life. This comes from the critic of a practical reason by Kant. Later, people carved it on Kant's tombstone. Schopenhauer believes that. If anyone who studies philosophy doesn't understand Kant, he is just a kid. Kant spent the first half of his life mainly studying the natural sciences, and the second half mainly on the philosophy of life. He has great insights and clear analysis into the rational thinking of human beings. The so-called rational thinking is the mental activity of making judgment or inference with clear concepts. Rational thinking should conform to formal logic. The thinking which goes against formal logic is called anti-rational thinking or irrational thinking. He divides the world into appearance and the thing in itself. Appearance is generated when the thing in itself works on our sense organs, forming empirical materials, coupled with the perception of people's sensibility and understanding. To put it simple, appearances are all the perceivable materials, including all the mental and physical phenomena. It's the objects which we cognize. The thing in itself is the noumenon to generate appearances. It includes the free will in the soul, the noumenon of the universe, and the Creator, God. The thing in itself is metaphysical. That is to say, the thing in itself cannot be ascertained by rational thinking, or nor proved by formal logic. When people try to cognize the thing in itself of a super experience with rational thinking above sensibility and understanding, they will inevitably fall into contradiction, which they cannot solve by themselves. This is antinomy. It's the contradiction between two propositions which exclude each other but are equally arguable. He listed four groups of antinomies. One, the world is limited in time and space. The world is unlimited in time and space. Two, the world is united. The world is diverse and divisible. Three, everything in the world is random or accidental and random. Everything in the world is determined or destined. Four, the world has its beginning. The world has no beginning. These subjects are subjects which any philosopher or theologist should face. If any philosopher or theologist keeps silent on them. Or accepts one thesis while rejecting another in a subjective and considered manner, he errs on the side of subjectivism. Strictly speaking, he cannot even be counted as a philosopher or theologist. At most, he is merely a thinker who is emotional but not rational. And Marx was such a thinker. He believes that 
the physical world is infinite, permanent, and absolute in a subjective and considered manner. Thus, in Kant's opinion, the noumenon cannot be interpreted by our rational thinking. Only the Holy Spirit in the mind is the path to the thing in itself. I agree with Kant. For example, the free will in the soul, the noumenon of the universe, and the Creator God, are all metaphysical issues, which are beyond the imagination of ordinary beings. Buddhism is against the passion on discussing metaphysical issues. It advocates pragmatic attitude. When Buddha Shakyamuni was alive, there were 96 non-Buddhist schools, each of whom insists their various understandings about the world's origin. Later, most of them were gradually convinced by Buddha, converted to Buddhism, and became Buddha's disciples. Of course. Buddha didn't answer these questions listed by Kant. When some disciples raised these issues, Buddha always dismissed them and cast them aside. Buddha said, "If a practitioner craves to know the answer of these questions rather than practice wisdom and compassion in the right way, then he will be already dead before he gets clear and satisfied." This is exactly like a person shot by a toxic arrow. When his relatives and friends find a doctor to treat for him, he says to the doctor, "Before taking the arrow out, please answer my questions. Which class does the person who hit me belong to? What's his name? What is his stature? Where is he from? Besides, what is his bow made of?" What is the bowstring made of? What is the shaft made of? What kind of a bird's feather is on the arrow horn? Doctor, if you cannot give me a satisfactory explanation, I won't treat my wound. In the practice of the holy life, an establishing liberation doesn't mean accepting or rejecting the questions raised by you, no matter what the popular assumption is. Positive or negative, we cannot use it to eliminate suffering in the world. However, what I'm trying to explain is the method to get rid of suffering, eliminate afflictions, establish liberation, and attain freedom. In the practice of the holy life, you can attain liberation. From liberation, you can attain boundless wisdom and power. At that time, why worry about not understanding the few questions raised by you? Teaching in accordance with the disciples' faculties and aptitudes is the method of Buddha in teaching and transforming sentient beings. The Buddha is not a computer; he won't simply answer any questions without thinking. He is a teacher who is very concerned about practical benefits. He is full of compassion and wisdom. He does not answer questions to show off his knowledge, but to help the questioner on the path of enlightenment. When he talks to a person, he always keep in mind the level, inclination, aptitude, character, and ability of understanding a certain issue of that person. Hence. Whether the world is knowable or unknowable doesn't depend on the world, but depends on the wisdom of those who are trying to get to know the world. Is it possible for a person with an IQ of 100 to become a physicist or philosopher? Isn't it wishful thinking to expect an ordinary being to know all the secrets of the world? Even the most famous Western philosopher only gets a rational knowledge of those antinomies. The greatest scientist in the world, Isaac Newton, did a research on the origin of the world in his last thirty years, and reached a conclusion: God creates everything. 
The quantum mechanics developed and established in the 1920s has gained a wide range of applications. However, the scientists, represented by Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, have encountered great confusion in doing their philosophical explanations of their theoretical basis. There has been fierce debate between them all the time. Actually, their debate center is the second and third group of the antinomies listed by Kant, regarding whether the world is united or diverse and divisible, and whether everything in the world is random or destined. They have argued for over 70 years, while still haven't reached a final conclusion.